I'm going to keep going on the theme of biblical support, and uh, I have to confess that my charts are not actually complete, but there's the important things uh, to make in chart form are there, which are some maps that are worth looking at. I think it's the first time I've ever used maps in a sermon. It may be the, the first time I've ever used maps, period. <laughs> not sure. <laughs> in a Bible study, but here we are. Um, biblical support partnership. There's something important about this that should be said, which is when we support a teacher or support somebody, send that person to preach, we are um, in partnership. That's a joint venture in preaching the gospel. We are, uh, you know, doing the work with them when they are doing the work. And so there's a, a fellowship there that's worth noticing, and it's important, you know, and, and it's, a, uh, it's a matter of, um, well, it's a matter of, of real importance that we're if effective and we're engaged in teaching the gospel and spreading the gospel with the support of those who are the teachers. And this is captured in Philippians 4 verses 15 to 16, and, and this is why it led me to maps. I started to realize there's a lot more to this that we should look at. But the idea of partnership is here in Philippians 4, 15 to 16. He said, you Philippians know, in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. So the... Church at Philippi is a church in the region called Macedonia. Philippi is a city in Macedonia. When Paul departed from Macedonia, he did not have any church in partnership with him regarding giving and receiving. In this chapter of Philippians 4, in these verses, it's very clear that we're talking about financial support that he received from the church at Philippi. He said, when I left... Macedonia to go on preaching you supported me you alone the other churches did not which is not to knock them it's just to say you know you are the ones Philippi is is responsible for this even in Thessalonica you sent me help for my needs once and again now he says even in Thessalonica not because it's far but because it's near Thessalonica is also in Macedonia <laughs> Berea is also in Macedonia but they didn't support him. Philippi supported him. And when he was in Macedonia, or when he was in Thessalonica, Philippi supported him there a couple of different times, um, which is interesting. But we'll get to that. What occurred to me in the study here about this is that, if you will, the church at Philippi bears, uh, in, in the sense that they're in a partnership with Paul, they bear some of the responsibility, if you will, for the teaching that Paul did while they supported him. So that got me to thinking, well, where did, how did this start anyway? Where did this come from? <laughs> and that's where we get to looking at the origins of the church at Philippi, which is detailed for us in Acts 16. And I, I'm about to run out of, uh, out of slides here, but that's all right. But I do have the rest of the sermon, just not in slide format. Um, Acts 16, verses 6 through 8 is where we are told about this. Paul and the traveling companions preaching the gospel go through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they'd come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So they gave Mysia a pass and went down to Troas. All right, there's a bunch of names, and if you're like me, before I prepared this lesson, you don't know where these places are. <laughs> uh, so I got to looking at it to find out where are these places and what are we saying. One thing that I found was this map. Huh. Can that be red? Is that clear out there? Are you go far away. <laughs> And near. No, we have uh, 
Syria here, right? Jerusalem's down here. You can't see him. But come up this way, right? You've got Tarsus of Cilicia, where Paul is from. And he's traveling up here. You might recognize Lycaonia. This is where you have um, Lystra, Derby, and Iconium, right? There's Galatia. There's Bithynia. There's Mycenae. So what he said, we went through Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Spirit to speak the word in Asia. We got as far as Mysia and attempted to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit would not allow it. So we passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. Right, so they were coming this way. They went through Galatia because they weren't allowed to preach here yet. Then they got to Mysia probably this little border here, and said, we'll go up to Bithynia. But the Spirit said no. So they went down, which means downhill. They went downhill to the shoreline, Troas. That's what happened. So, that's where the rest of Acts uh, 16 comes in. And I'm not sure how to swap, but I'm going to try it. It works. Okay. <laughs> Acts 16, verse 9, beginning. 9 to 12, a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on to Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So, setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city in the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days. Right, so here from Troas straight up to Samothrace, straight over to Neapolis, and right up next door to Philippi. So they took the nonstop to Samothrace and the nonstop to Neapolis, <laughs> which happens to be right next to Philippi. Okay, so that's where they that's where they went, and it says they spent time in Philippi, and the rest of this chapter is there. This may be where you remember. There was a riot where in the 23rd verse, Paul and his companions were arrested, Acts 16, 23. When they had inflicted many blows on them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. And you may recall, too, that this jailer in Philippi, Acts 16, verse 32, had the word of the Lord spoken to him and all in his house. This jailer took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized immediately, he and his family. He brought them up into his house and set food before them and rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. That's 32, 33, 34, right? So when Paul goes to uh, Philippi, this is what's happening. The place doesn't really like the idea of the gospel. Um, corruption has brought mobs um, to attack and he has been, he and his companions have been beaten, meaning they had wounds. Uh, the jailer had not washed their, nobody washed their wounds. They were fastened in stocks. But when the jailer obeyed the gospel, he washed their wounds. And now he set food before them and their guests in his house. And when it was day, the magistrates sent the police saying, let them go. But that's the great, that's the good part, see. Because then at 37, Paul can say, they've beaten us publicly, uncondemned Roman citizens and have thrown us into prison. Why is that the good part? Well, because all of that is strictly illegal. The magistrates of Philippi, a leading city of a Roman province, are now in big trouble with Rome. They just broke the law by beating and incarcerating a Roman citizen, 
a native-born Roman citizen. Not to mention whoever's with him. They may all be native, I don't know. That's the big deal. Now do they throw us out secretly? Nuh-uh. Let them come here themselves and take us out. Right? They want to send a messenger and say, get out of here. And they said, oh no, no, you're going to come down here. <laughs> We're going to make sure everybody knows that you did this. The police reported these words to the magistrates. They were afraid when they heard that these were Roman citizens, as they should be. So they came and apologized to them and took them out and asked them to leave the city. Well, they left the prison and visited with the woman who was hosting them at the time or in whose home they were staying. And when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. What's the encouragement, right? Well, the encouragement is you're not going to have any trouble from these guys anymore. We got a mob. We got mobbed. We got beaten. We got thrown in. But they're not going to mention it. They're going to let you talk because the minute something happens to you, I'll mention it to my buddies in Rome. And they know that, right? That's what this means. <laughs> they know that. They're not going to bug you anymore. That's what this means. So Philippi has freedom. Even in Thessalonica. So again, um, all of this up here, I guess above there is Macedonia. So Berea is in Macedonia, Thessalonica is in Mas Macedonia, Apollonia, Amphipolis, and Philippi. Those are all Macedonians. This is where Greece starts. Right. But yeah, even in Th Thessalonica, right? And that's Acts 17, verses 1 and 2, when they passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews, and Paul went in, as was his custom. On three Sabbaths, he reasoned with them from the Scriptures. So he's got three weeks there, three or four. In the 8th, ninth, and 10th verses of Acts 17 records, the people and the city authorities were disturbed on hearing these things, and when they'd taken money as security from Jason and the others, they let them go. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And having arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. So in Thessalonica, they spent about three, four weeks. But we read in Philippians 4 that Philippi sent him support twice while he was there. Now he's going into Berea. In Berea, the 10th verse records where he went, entered the, the Jewish synagogue, 11 and 12 follows. These Jews were more noble, noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them therefore believed, with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. All right, so what's Paul doing? Is this any good? <laughs> well, yes. He has established a church in Thessalonica. He has established a church in Berea. People obeyed the gospel in Thessalonica, People, many people obeyed the gospel in Berea. So you can see the trajectory of this as we're going up, you know, making the round around the, the, the shoreline here. After Berea, where do you go? Well, you go down to Greece. This is Greece, which is known in the New Testament as Achaia, Acts 17.15. Those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens. And we know that he went to Athens, and we know what's recorded in Athens, how he preached there. The 34th verse said, Some joined him and believed, among whom were Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. So some people obeyed the gospel in Athens. But the 18th chapter continues this thought. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, which is just right over, just across, a little further over. Left Athens, goes to Corinth, and in Corinth it is recorded. 
He found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, which was Bithynia, where they didn't go first time. Recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. But Paul went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked. They were tent makers by trade. And we know from 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, 2 Thessalonians 3, that Paul worked while he was traveling at the same time. We find in Acts 18.11, he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them at Corinth. The 18th verse records, he stayed many days longer. He took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria, taking with him Priscilla and Aquila. But before he departed at Cancria, he had taken an oath. He cut his hair because of a vow, which is right here, Cancria. So what we're saying is when about, what, 18 months later, he was going to leave the Greek city-states, Achaia, he departed from the port, which is Cancria, and that all the way across to Ephesus. <laughs> but he had shaved his head there in Cancria. He was on his way back. He had fulfilled that vow. But that's what Achaia is. The regions of Achaia means Greece. Uh, in fact, it's kind of what you could argue they might have called themselves that. Uh, in the Iliad, they're called the Achaeans. And if you read translations of the Iliad, you'll see they're, they're Achaeans. Um, in fact, one of my favorite, one of my favorite silly things about that is the uh, the Greek language is very concrete. They don't say that people did something all night. They say they call those all night people. So. Uh, we would say the Achaeans fought through the night, but they said the all-night Achaeans fought. <laughs> and uh, I thought, if I ever start a band, we're going to be the all-night Achaeans. <laughs> but Achaea is just Greece, that's all. So in Athens, in Corinth, plausibly at Cancria, he's teaching and preaching and doing the work. In Athens, it, there were some who obeyed, not too many. At Corinth, you have a church. If we look back in Athens, in Acts 17, verse 22, where's my mouse? Yeah, that's working. All right, let's look at Athens, Acts, 20, or Acts 17, rather. So here we are, uh, in this map, we are focused down on uh, Achaia. There's, that's uh, Macedonia, right? Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea. But down here, you're getting into Greece. This is Achaia. There's Athens, Corinth. Rome's over here. But this is where we are. In Acts 17, uh, 22, you may recall what Paul said, standing in the midst of the hill of Ares. He said, men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you're very religious. As I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, I now proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. I want us to stop for a minute and consider what Paul just did. <laughs> the hill of Ares is at the end of the marketplace. There's the agora, the, the, the major place of commerce in the city of Athens, is you know built lengthwise and at the end of it there is this hill that is Ares Hill or from the you know for the god Mars or Ares. Right? But the thing about it is if you're in the Agora and you're looking at Mars Hill, the backdrop for you is the Acropolis. 
That's what you see back there is, is the Acropolis. So I want you to understand what Paul has done as he's standing on a hill talking to people in the Agora who are looking back at him and seeing the backdrop of the Acropolis, which is, you know, what I mean, right? That's the major temple of Athena. And he said, <laughs> the God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. That's what he just did. <laughs> he stood right there and said, this thing here is vain. You guys are so proud of all of this, but it's just fake. Not that he was rude about it, but to say that's the message. They took the message. They understood what he was saying. They were willing to entertain what he was saying. Which is interesting, but only to a point. But to understand, Philippi had something to do with this. That's what we're saying. Would you like the opportunity to stand, you know, with an audience of Greeks and whoever happens to be there doing business and be able to proclaim the word of God so boldly like this? Well, if you are a member of Philippi, then you can because you sent Paul and he preached this. That's what we're saying. They're in partnership. It's a joint venture. Philippi did this as much as Paul did. And, you know, the rest of this account, perhaps, but 29 to 31, since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think the divine nature is like gold, silver, or stone. We are his offspring, not gold, silver, and stone. The stuff behind me up here, right? On the top of that hill back yonder. An image formed by art and the imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he's appointed. Of this, he's given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Wouldn't it be wonderful to, to say such things and to be able to help people come to the knowledge of sin and, and repent and be saved? Yes. And again, Philippi has a part in this because they sent him. They're in a partnership. That's what we're getting at. In Acts 18, we read about Corinth, right? So after he leaves Athens, he hops over to Corinth. It's not far. Acts 18, 5 through 8. Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia again. And when they did, Paul was occupied at the time with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. When they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I'll go to the Gentiles. He left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Eustus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. <laughs> So he goes to stay with a Roman who nonetheless is a worshiper of God and has a house right next to the synagogue. He sounds a little bit like Cornelius, doesn't he? Crispus, ruler of the synagogue, also believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians hearing Paul believed and were baptized. But Paul's ability to stay there and to teach and to have that opportunity to be among them and, and to, to work with those who were the leaders and who should have been the rightful spiritual leaders like Crispus was very good. They obeyed the gospel and the church there was established. I think I'm out of pictures here. I am out of pictures. All right. But I need to read this. It's going to keep coming back. Sorry. Um, we're almost finished anyway. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 8 through 9. Remember what Paul said. I'll leave you with these, these things. Okay. First thing he said was, I robbed other churches, Corinth, by accepting support from them in order to serve you. When I was with you and I was in need, I didn't burden anyone there. 
The brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. Right, so we can see Philippi definitely paid for this. And his own hands, you know, tent making with Priscilla and Aquila, who have traveled with him through Greece doing the same. And they were in the places where you could do that, right? People in Corinth and in Athens both were trade, doing trade. They were near to the water. Tent makers, you know, it's fine. But um, it's clear that Philippi supported them, or supported him, rather. And they are partners in this. They, they're helping him. And working with him in spreading the gospel in other nations as he travels. That's an interesting thing. It means that we get a benefit when we support a faithful teacher. We benefit from the teaching that he does. We are participants in the spread of the truth wherever that person is teaching. In 2 John, we should go... And I'll leave you with these words. 2 John 8 through 11. There's a warning in 2 John and there's a promise in 3. 2 John 8 through 11. Watch yourselves that you may not lose what we've worked for, but may win a full reward. Everyone who goes on ahead and doesn't remain inside the confines of the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever remains inside the confines of the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and doesn't bring this teaching... Do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting, for whoever greets him is a partner in his wicked works. So this is a warning that you got to be careful who you partner with. When you send somebody, you know, as in when you support somebody to teach, you're responsible for the teaching they do. And that could be to your credit, as was Philippi and Paul, or that could be to your detriment if you're supporting somebody who is not being straightforward about the gospel. And then 3 John 5 through 8, Beloved, it's a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers though they be, who testified to your love in front of the whole church. You'll do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God, for they've gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these, so that we may be fellow workers for the truth. Now, we don't know uh, to whom John wrote this or the time at which he wrote it, but this could plausibly speak about Paul and time, uh, Timothy and Silas, Priscilla and Aquila. It, it could talk about those who were traveling through Greece not accepting money from the Gentiles. They were not accepting any money from Achaia. If it, whether it was talking about them or not, the pattern is familiar. When you're first spreading the gospel, you don't want any impediments there. You support those people. You send them to preach. And so it is with these. If we send them out like this and we support people like this, we are fellow workers for the truth. And that's all I know about that. But I thought it was worth talking about. We enter into partnership. We work together. You're responsible for the teaching that's being done whether that's good or whether that's evil, but I hope that in your case that is good. If today you are not yet a Christian, become a Christian. Have forgiveness of sins available to you. Have the blood of Christ wash away everything. The reason that they were willing to travel land and sea was to teach this good news that you can be forgiven. You can be right with God. If today you're a Christian and haven't lived right, let us pray that you might be restored to him. If you need our prayers, if you need to obey the gospel, let that be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected.